Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Future of the Fortress read-along. I've been doing this show now for over two years, which is kind of insane when you think about it. If you've never seen one of these before, it is a community Q&A session with Toady One. In these Q&As, uh, there is a lot of speculation and future discussion, as well as current events and stuff that is currently being worked on. So it's kind of a mishmash of a community brainstorming session and a Q&A. If you would like to uh, take part in these conversations yourself, there's a link to the forum thread down in the description. Simply sign up to the Bay 12 forums and make an account, and then dive in. So without any further discussion, let's dive into the questions. First question comes in from Klinodev, and he asks, I wonder if you could give us a quick near-term summary of the things you plan on working on for the next two months or so. Not asking for any predictions of what you will get done, just a plan, like we used to get in the devlogs of what you'd like to work on. And Tarn's response is, I'd like to work on adventure mode, mainly. It's overdue. It just involves converting menus one at a time, and finally getting those travel pictures to start. The Linux release is on a Steam beta, and once that's clear of crashes and major problems, we should have that up everywhere, including here on Classic. This opens up the door to Mac work. I imagine that we're nearly to the phase where a new Mac computer enters the scene. We also have a parallel track of interface widgets going on, which should help not only with adventure mode menus, but in getting keyboard support back up and in Fortland. We're also working on bugs in parallel. Patches should continue while Adventure Mode progresses. It's important for me to actually get through Adventure Mode, so I'm not going to prioritize Fort Mode balance or features until that's done. But changes and fixes like the ones you see for version 50.10, patch notes, announcements, and ammo, and rotten food, and rooms, and stuck in trees, etc., will continue to be addressed. As an additional fourth parallel track, we have some graphics ready that I need to get typed in from my end. And that's ongoing. I'm the bottleneck on this and most everything else. Not much to do about that. And when life is rough or strange, as it has been, stuff is slow. Next is a double whammy from Crazy Old Fishman and Nip Wheeler, and they both ask, at the risk of adding to the chorus, is there any update on the Mac OS versions? I've seen written by Putnam that it could be as simple as pressing a button. As an experienced developer myself, I know this to be, at the very least, highly optimistic. However, I would really love to know that it is too difficult to do rather than untried. May I also softly hint that Mac OS users comprise about a third of the market. I could find the source, but that would be pedantic even for me. And that, as Mac OS has switched to ARM64 and Arch64, it might be prudent to release a version for Mac and Linux users on ARM. I know that I at least have not bought a copy yet, as it doesn't run on my personal computer. Perhaps this is true for a significant number of people. Also from Nip Wheeler, I'm in the same boat as Crazy Old Fishman. I really want to try this game on my Mac, but I don't want to muck about with wineskin, and any updates on macOS versions would be much appreciated. Tarn quotes Putnam's response, so I'm going to read her response first, and she says, It was intended as my perfect world, highly optimistic statement. Yes. I expect it to take much longer, far longer, like once I get a setup. I'm expecting it to take, well, longer than is reasonable. It could be a button press, but it probably won't be. I get that. Don't you worry. And Tarn's response is, We continue to follow the original plan, as reflected in the replies here. Linux is nearly done, up on the public Steam beta now. That gets us through a lot of the compiler trouble, but not through the SDL2 and FMOD etc etc potential issues. We'll just have to see where we are at once we have our hardware. And regarding the soft hint, Mac people are more like 1-5% to of Steam sales, depending on the game, since they are around 3% of Steam users, and the pre-Steam DF downloads reflected this as well. So it seems to be general, personal computer situation. Maybe you are counting mobile. In any case, 1% is enough reason to do a port. Did it before and doing it now. It's good when more people are able to play the game, and if they can do so without an emulator. At some point, it becomes a compilation and tech and hardware and virtual machine, etc. Burden that is hard to overcome for systems with fewer users. But 3% is a lot, really. The same goes for the translation and localization if we can ever figure that out. The next question comes in from Silvering235, and they say, Threeto, what was slash is the intended pronunciation of the direct the diuretics in dwarven and the other relevant languages if possible 
And Tarn's response is, There was never an intended pronunciation from us. Don't even know what kinds of sounds dwarven mouths can make. The next question comes in from Brailbard, or Brawlbard, and they ask, Maybe this has been discussed before, but I was wondering what, are, what the odds are that saves from the current version will be compatible with the future Adventure Mode release. And Tarn's response is, Odds are currently really good. Something could come up, but it's less likely this time than it was with Fort Mode. Conversions since the base objects of the game shared are shared with Adventure Mode have already been moved over. And I don't have to worry about active Adventure Mode games the way I had to worry about active Fort Mode games, since there aren't any in the versions we're compatible with. The next question comes in from Nihil Lihich. I've tried that one before and butchered it before, and I will butcher it again. And they say... You mentioned color matching of cave floors to their stone types being distracting, and that got me thinking, what's up with rock layer generation? I know in earlier versions of Dwarf Fortress 40D, question mark, that rock generation, or at least metal generation, used to be different. From a geological standpoint, the generation today is quite strange, with giant ovals of different rock stacking over each other like the biggest layer cake on Earth, and from the circus to the surface. With every map tile, you basically know what you'll always get. A base square of layer of stone, a giant oval of a different layer of a stone, and in the middle, a, and zero to several ores zigzagging through it. Why is this done this way? Is the rock gen a holdover from 23A days or such? Any plans to model, like, uh, in... I can't pronounce that word. Ingenious uh, in, intrusion, I tried. Uh, plate tectonics, or stratified rocks, with the rock tiles themselves in-game? Do geologists ever send you letters? And Tarn quotes Eric Blank's response, so we're going to read their response first, and they say, I would send him letters, but they would basically encompass an entire college textbook and would just be annoying. And yeah, the ore and mineral generation has been mostly unchanged for forever now, at least as far back as 2009. And ideas to improve on it have been mentioned during, after, either, or both, Matt Myth and Magic, or the map rewrite. I don't know of any games that accurately depict geology or biology that you see in the real world. At least DF has ores showing up in the right geological environments, though, instead of something like biome dependencies. I don't think plate tectonics is really a possibility, at least not for Dwarf Fortress. Maybe it, it could be set up to draw plates and set whether or not boundaries are converging and diverging and subducting or passing and generate mountain ranges where continual plates are colliding and rift valleys where they're pulling apart and put volcanoes there and where one is subducting the under the other. But simulating actual geologic history between plates would be like a whole program to itself. Uh, like Universe Sandbox, but for a single planet. After reading that, does anybody else want that to exist? I want to simulate earthquakes, please. And Tarn's response is, I don't think it was much different before, back in the 2D days. Maybe veins were larger? When I chopped the world up into 48 by 48 tiles for adventure mode, seamless movement, and better embark selection stuff had to be contained in those, without a lot of metadata or more coherent global noise function, etc. This is all solvable, but hasn't been a priority, especially now while the map rewrite hangs over everything. The next quote comes in from Lazy Mandius, and they say, Is there any plans to tighten up the needs system and make dwarves a little better at satisfying their own needs if given the opportunity? There are good workarounds for everything, but the five Fs, I believe, faith, family, friends, food, and romance. And Tarn's response is, I'm not sure we'll be doing much with this until we get through adventure mode, etc. It'll be interesting to see what goes into patches in parallel to adventure mode dev, as the granular issues get fixed. Social issues generally have been an annoying problem for a long while, so it's not entirely off the radar there. Now the next one is a multi-parter which I've broken up, and it comes in from Hayes, although I'm only going to read their name once, and they say... Will the new quest system be the only feature we get for Adventure Mode, or will there be something soon in the near future? And Tarn's response is, We're just trying to get Adventure Mode together now. After that, there are villains and army stuff and magic, so... and so forth. It's not clear what will be in the initial Adventure Mode release. From a strict conversation with some bug fixes and some new features, since it'll depend on how long it takes. Second part of their question is... 
I heard that there will be new starting scenarios one day, and I thought that probably is a pretty big thing to add. So I wanted to ask if it will affect adventure mode as well, except that we will be able to find them in the world and interact with NPCs there. And will new scenarios be similar to, fortress, to a fortress scenario, or will they give new mechanics or change them in any way? Will there be scenarios that you didn't mention or list, or the list that we know is probably all scenarios that we will have? That was written very strangely and difficult to read. And Tarn's response is, yeah, every start scenario is basically a new way for settlements to interact with the world and their own and other civilizations. I expect that to reverberate through all corners of the game. Now, this next one is also a two-parter, but Tarn responds to both of them at the same time, so I will read them both and then read his response. It comes in from Sofan Thiel, and they ask, Will we see a more fleshed-out and gradual development process with extra interlude youth stages in the future, i.e. toddlers, kids, adolescents, adults? It is quite odd for the dwarf to play make-believe with their toy boat one day and then be recruited into the army the next. If not, are there plans to alter either time progression or aging speed in order to balance out the fact that it takes 18 whole years for a resident to mature, making it harder to have fort-born babies grow up to adulthood, resulting in multi-generational fortresses being even less feasible now? And Tarn's response is, I'd prefer to flesh out the process. Sure, I don't expect to change the speed, but it's straightforward to mod the ages to be faster. The first myth pass will probably be when we start poking at the edges of how. Days, months, years, calendars, moons, suns, etc. are structured, and that would offer some kind of control. But the creature age progression is probably still independent of that, and would just need a mod. The next question comes in from Orange of Cthulhu, and they say, About Steam release of Adventure Mode. I wonder if the intention is just to do graphics and fix the many UIs and then release it with pretty much the gameplay of pre-Steam version, or if the goal is to streamline it some more before release by filing out some of the holes in the gameplay, such as the impossibility of getting clothes and armor for very large or small animal people. And Tarn's response is, it's just not clear at this point. We're aware Adventure Mode is a much rougher and less game-like creature than Fort Mode, which is somewhat rough and somewhat ungamelike. But regardless, we're going to have to do the basic conversion, so we're focusing on that. After the initial release, the plans are all heavily Adventure Mode inflected anyway, so it's kind of interchangeable anyway. The competing concerns are getting as timely a release as we can relatively, and having a release that's a bit more polished in some sense. Same as the fort mode concerns, really, but exacerbated. The next question comes in from Ear, and they say, Will myth and magic include an achievable source of perpetual longevity? My fortresses in older versions eventually lose to ten dwarves every year to old age. It's kind of heartbreaking. I understand that death is to be accepted in Dwarf Fortress, but it should be not a third of the fortress for no reason, causing the player to abandon their history. And Tarn's response is, I'm not sure what you mean by no reason. Eventually, it'll be the whole fort, since people die, in fantasy, settings and tales, etc. Perpetual longevity usually comes at a cost, and I expect the myth and magic release will vis variously grapple with this, the current necromancers being a simple version, and also a solution to your problem. If you get a book in the library, though, of course, there are all sorts of issues with that. Ultimately, if you want longevity as a technical addition to your playstyle, I'd mod the dwarves to be immortal. The in-game stuff we offer later is generally going to be messier, I think. If your question is more pointing to something about how natural deaths are spaced out in a buggy way or something, that's a separate matter. Maybe that would be because of migrant demographics being lumped in with the fast waves up to 200, and then there'd be an initial band of death, but it would smooth out over time, like a long time, a very, very, very old fort. The next question comes in from Contaco, and they say, G'day, Tarn. I vaguely seem to recall there being a smell, 
sense in adventure mode. And I was wondering if it applied to fortress mode. Dogs are mentioned to have a keen sense of smell, but they look like they lack the smell trigger token. Is it important? Are dogs in a way, in any way, better at spotting sneaky intruders than any other animal? The wiki mentioned that hunting dogs have an improved observer skill, though it doesn't seem to find it when I looked. Tarn's response is, no, there's nothing in Fort Moore generally for smell. Hunting critters get a 50% increased view range for spotting and sneaking people, but I'm not sure if that affects things in practice, since the function may become unrelated. Hunting creatures also sneak when accompanying a hunter, which should help with prey being spotted as they approach, but I'm not sure. Hunting units are very, very old. So I guess Tarn just told everybody that if you want to have a, a method of spotting sneaking elves, simply uh, train your, your watch bear to be a hunting watch bear before you chain them up in the tower, uh, and then they'll spot them 50% faster. Uh, the next question comes in from Kayo1995, and they say, Do you plan on messing with Forgotten Beasts' behavior for the Villains Update Part 2? It would be cool to have scheming monsters trying to turn your fortress into a cult, or something. And Tarn's response is, There's a lot to do here. But the humanoid villains that can interact with civilization have more la levers to pull, so they'll continue uh, to be the focus. We did have a whole Mega Beast AI section, as I recall, on dev, at least an outline of sorts. Would still be good to make them properly troublesome, in various ways. The next question comes in from Yoyoped1, and their question is, Is there a particular reason that you can only occupy already occupied locations. And Tarn's response is, I think it has to do with the reclaim mechanic, and that sending off the squads to raid or occupy depends on there being civilians for trouble, or to be the government, etc. But there's no core reason why you shouldn't be sending off settlers or caravans, etc., other than it being some work to implement. The next question also comes in from Contaco, and they say, I was inspecting the images on an artifact by my dwarf it had created and thought, will we see a coherent multi-scene images across engravings or other depictations in the myth update, similar to how coherent story-like events will be used to construct mythology, a mythology? I get that systems like this are planned to enter the game eventually. Really, I thought of asking the question as the myth system seemed like it could be a multi-purpose in that way. Although, admittedly, I understand very little about how any of these systems would work. I imagine something like a repeated use of particular icons or mentioning a list of various independent images in a concluding statement that the scene depicts uh, a particular site or event. And Tarn's response is... It's sort of related, and sort of not, in its way. The new myths attempt to be coherent, but the current history generation is already coherent. It's just vast simulation in its vast simulation-ish way. So we could have been doing a multi-step stuff already. Were there chapters in the game biographies? I remember toying with this and picking a few chronological events related to a given subject. Anyway, don't recall if that made it in, but certainly more can be done. The next question comes in from Rhino, and they say, Has the team considered the logistics for adding sprite overlays on artifact items, such as more of their materials and adornments are rendered? And Tarn's response is to this final question, We had this for a time, for all of the furniture, and had to scrap it with the big scrap. But it's certainly doable. Many of the items are already built from layers and get pixel-wise recoloration, etc. Spikes and rings and such, definitely within grasp and it's a little harder to get them reflected on creature equipment. And as I foreshadowed, that brings us to the end of this month's Future of the Fortress. If you enjoyed this episode and you would like to see episodes and shows like this continue, check out my Patreon, and of course, send in your questions to the Bay 12 forums. In link is down in the description. My patrons are on the screen right now, and I wouldn't be able to produce these shows without them, so shoutouts to my patrons. And of course, supporting this YouTube channel is also a way to help me out by simply subscribing or leaving a like or a comment. And lastly, I would like to remind everybody, if you miss my VODs from this channel, uh, I have a second channel. It's called Blind Extras. You can find a link to that down in the description as well. It's where all of the archives of my live streams go if you just want something to listen to in the background. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one.